It's question show time. Your questions, my answers, as always, wherever you are, across my channel, question pops in your brain, write it down, I'll gather them up, and I'll answer them here. Again, stick around. We've got a special guest answerer at the end of the show from the American Astronomical Society meeting. We are running out, just a couple more, but stick around for that. All right, let's get into the questions. Kara looks one. Starship will land on the moon before NASA crew or any other lander. SpaceX built almost SN1 Starship insanely fast. They definitely reach orbit this year. Yeah, so SN1 doesn't exist anymore. Uh, it exploded, um, just like the previous Starship prototype did. So now you've got two Starship prototypes, both of which have exploded, uh, as well as one intentional test that that blew the top off of their pressure tank. And then, of course, the wildly successful Star Hopper test, which was the flying water tank. The point of this is just is that this is very difficult. This is going to take a long time. And and there was like, you know, we did this video about the Artemis mission. and There must have been 50 sort of just like, hey, you know, why bother SpaceX is going to make it to the moon before NASA does. So here's the problem, right? The problem why we didn't go to the moon for 50 years is that there was no competition. There was just NASA. And nobody else was trying to go to the moon. And NASA wasn't, you know, they were doing the space shuttle. And then maybe they were going to go to the moon, but then they were going to go to Mars, then they're going to go to the moon. And so we just sat in this limbo. But now, we have NASA's plans with SLS, with the Artemis program. We've got SpaceX with the Starship. We've got the Chinese plans to put humans on the moon. We've got potentially the European Space Agency wants to help build a moon village. The Russians have said they're going to go there. There's been many, like was that at least five, there's possibly more independent competing groups that are working to accomplish this feat next. You've got five heavy lift vehicles that you could choose from if you want to go to the moon, not including Starship. You've got Blue Origins, New Glenn, you've got the uh, the Omega, you've got you've got the SLS, you've got the Falcon Heavy, uh, and others. Uh, Delta Heavy? Anyway, there's a bunch of big spacecraft. And there's lots of people that are working on different kinds of landing systems, commercial landing systems, and human rated landing systems. And this is competition. And you're going to see all of these people all working together. And it was it was funny to me that there was a lot of these comments that were very much like, don't bother, let SpaceX do it. And that's how we got into this problem in the first place. Never again should we not bother and wait for somebody else to do the thing, right? Because that is the removing of competition. So whenever you hear of anyone saying that they're going to accomplish something like this, whether they're going to go to Mars, whether they're going to go to the moon, whether they're going to build a satellite network, whatever it is, more competition is better. And you should hope and encourage every single one of these programs to, um, to proceed ferociously, but cautiously towards whatever is this accomplishment. And the better that more people do across this entire field, the better chances that we are going to make it to one of these places. And this time, we're going to stay. And so when you see what happened with the failure of the Starship prototype, you see that this is really difficult, that in fact, there's going to be delays, that SpaceX is probably going to take longer than we have originally been led to believe. And good thing that nobody is waiting for any one provider to solve this problem. So. Uh, maybe SpaceX will make it to the moon first. Maybe Artemis will make it to the moon first. Maybe Artemis will make four missions and then SpaceX will take over. And maybe the new Glenn and whatever the new Armstrong is, is going to be completely dominant. Doesn't matter. There's competition. You should be glad. And let's just see how this all plays out. Nature double think. I think the focus on Dyson spheres, von Neumann probes, and the Kardashev scale is kind of a cognitive bias. So this is kind of in reference to us trying to predict what future civilizations are going to do or what advanced civilizations are going to do. And of course, the idea of a Dyson sphere or Dyson swarm, um, where you've got all of these spacecraft that are completely surrounding a star system is sort of one specific technological outcome for an idea. But the underlying ideas are what I think you really want to be able to focus your, I, you know, focus your thoughts on. And so 
when we think about the growth of human energy, right, we over the last, say, 5000 years have experienced pretty much an uninterrupted growth in our ability to generate energy. And right now, every year, we produce about one to 2% more energy every year. And that's an exponential growth. And if you chart that forward, it gets kind of amazing, right? Within about 2500 3000 years, um, we will be using all the energy or we will be generating we will be, have harnessed the equivalent amount of energy that is coming off the sun. So now, is that a cognitive bias? Well, maybe, right? Maybe at some point in the future, our energy use will stop or go down. That's possible, right? Um, I can't imagine why, because even if all we want to do is contemplate science and make better and more powerful computers, we can imagine some future civilization using all the power of the sun to try to solve the biggest problems that they can comprehend, right? That better computers, more simulations, who knows what they're going to use them for. So there's no reason to believe why we won't continue to grow our energy use. And so you just chart that forward and you know when you're going to be using all of the energy of the sun. And so then you, you ask yourself, what is an engineering solution which allows you to harness all the energy of the sun? You know, one is you dismantle an entire sun and run your fusion reactors and use up all the sun. That's one idea. Another idea is that you uh, feed the sun to a black hole and then the black hole is firing out radiation as it's consuming the sun. That's another way. And another way that can be imagined is you surround your entire sun in some kind of cloud of satellites that are able to harness all of the power that's coming from it. Same idea with the von Neumann probes, right? Which is just like we can imagine wanting to explore. And we can imagine building a self-replicating robot probe to help us explore. And we can imagine some far future where we send our spacecraft to one star system and then it builds a bunch more and they go to another star system and so on and so forth. So the cognitive bias is absolutely true. It's entirely possible that we are seeing the universe, seeing the world from our own perspective. And yet a lot of these things seem kind of inevitable on our current path. And of course, it could come across that, oh, it turns out that we've reached some point where we don't want to grow anymore, we don't want to explore anymore, we're no longer curious, and then all that stops. And maybe it's something that hits all civilizations, and we're just not aware of this happening yet, and at some point, we will cease. But so far, if you chart back human history for 5,000 years, it's what we always do. And so it doesn't seem weird that we would want to do that in the future. And then it also doesn't seem weird that other civilizations might want to do that too. And if they don't, right, if, if other civilizations aren't out there exploring the galaxy, out there trying to use the resources of their star, then we will. Then we or our robot overlords will come knocking at some point in the next few thousand years and go shame you didn't get around to using the resources of all those stars over there because humanity's here and that's what we do. So it doesn't seem too unusual to imagine that an alien civilization would have thought about that potential threat and, uh, and been prepared for it. Again, it's not, it's not like I'm glad that's what we do. It's just what humanity has a tendency of doing. Animas. This guy's head bounces around like he's a bobblehead doll. Thanks for your feedback. Obviously, this isn't something that I can control. I don't think maybe some better neck exercises or something. Um, but you know, obviously, uh, you can't really control uh, how you look um, beyond a certain point. You know, shave your head, go full Picard. But you know, and I, I get my share of this kind of thing, uh, obviously. And you know, I'm, I feel like I'm, yeah, I can handle it, right? For, you know, it's a fraction of, of everything that I get. But I know that a lot of people, a lot of YouTubers, get a lot of really terrible comments from people. And so I just want to take a second and just like really remind you that all the people that you interact with on YouTube are real human beings. And, um, and try to make the world a better place. Don't make it a worse place. Um, my daughter always says you shouldn't comment on someone's appearance uh, unless they can fix it in about five seconds. So in other words, you know, if they've got like a like a flower or leaf in their hair and you can kind of pull it out and then it's fixed. Otherwise, you know, it doesn't make sense to comment on other people's appearance, but 
Um, that's all. Just try to make the world a better place. You know, we have the internet is brand new, and we are learning what it's like to sort of mash all these people together into one place. And a lot of the time, it makes our lives so much better. And then every now and then, it makes our lives worse. And I would be happier. I think we should try to make other people's lives better if we can. Magnus. What is not clear is what humans can do that probes, robots, and other automatic systems can't do on the moon as to justify such dangerous and expensive feats. Also, you don't need humans to test rockets. Probes are way lighter, close enough to the Earth to be monitored, and even corrected in an easier way than those sent to Mars. Can make all sorts of experiments and even take samples that could be sent back to Earth in smaller modules and all done in the same way, way cheaper form and without risking human lives. That's a snippet of the comment. It actually goes on for longer, but you get the gist of it, right? Which is why send humans to space when robots can do the job cheaper, more efficiently, and you don't have to risk a human life to be able to do it. And that is a great question. And this is one of the big arguments that that scientists have that people who are excited about space exploration have. And in general, they're like, why send humans when you can send robots? And if what you're trying to do is science, if you're trying to scientifically understand the chemicals on that asteroid, if you're trying to scientifically understand if there's life on Mars, if all these scientific experiments, I 100% agree with you. There is no reason to send human beings. You should only send robots, ever. The reason you send humans into space is to learn how to send humans into space. That that if you can imagine some future where we have some sort of solar system spanning civilization, it, was, it will be because we learned the lessons of how to live and work in space. And the only way to do that is to just do it. And so I actually think that anytime people try to justify human space exploration and say, well, there will be scientific benefit, right? We're going to be able to go and get rocks from the moon, or we're going to be able to understand whether or not there's life on Mars. I don't think that argument really holds because for every one of those scientific discoveries that you want to make, I can recommend a robot that'll do the job better. But there is no replacement for learning how to live and work and be in space and become a solar system spanning civilization. And that it's only going to come from step by step, iterative, testing, discovering, learning all of our human shortcomings until we get to this point that we are capable of living in space. So there are two separate concepts. You send robots to do science, you send humans to send humans. And so it is its own objective. Now you can say that there's no reason for humans to ever go to space. And I think there's a pretty good argument for that, right? But like never, ever? Like in a thousand years, 10,000 years, there will never be a time when it, you can imagine that humans will want to go to space and will have some sort of solar system spanning civilization, right? And so if we're going to be doing it someday, we might as well get started. Swamp Thing 401. Man, please stop with this premier bullshit. So I've been using the premiere functionality of YouTube for a couple of months now, and I really like it, right? Because what it lets me do is it lets me queue up a time when the video is going to be shown, and then I get to show up, and a whole bunch of people, a few hundred people get to show up with me at the same time, we all get to watch the video together, and then I'm in the chat, and I'm answering additional questions, and people are catching, maybe if you catch a mistake, hasn't happened yet, but it might, um, uh, catch a mistake that we make, then we can pull the video down and fix it, and you guys can help us improve it. So it's a great experience. It's kind of like this really cool community. But every time I post a new premiere, I get a bunch of complaints. And I've been pinning them so that I can just keep having this argument and wait for somebody to tell me something that, you know, some really killer reason why we shouldn't be using this service. And the gist of why people don't like it is it makes a little video show up in their subscription feed that they can't watch. And it, and it just gets under their skin. So uh, I've got a couple of recommendations for you. So like if 
we put up these premieres. Like, I'm going to keep using the premieres because I really am having a lot of fun. And I know a lot of people are enjoying watching them with me. So if you don't like them, you can click the little dot, dot, dot at the top of the video and hide it from your feed. And then that'll make that video disappear. And then you won't have to watch it. Now, I don't think you'll be able to watch it after. Like, it won't be recommended to you after the video has actually gone live. But, you know, maybe that feedback will go back to YouTube and they'll realize that people want some way to control whether or not they see these premieres. So that would be useful feedback to YouTube. The second recommendation that you can make is like if you still want to get my videos but you don't want to see those premieres what you can do is sign up for my newsletter because I'll post links to all of the new videos and so like three four days after the video goes live you'll get an email from me it'll list the videos you can watch the ones that you want and so you unsubscribe from my YouTube channel but subscribe to the newsletter and then you'll get those ones. Um, the other option, of course, you could just unsubscribe from the YouTube channel, right? And I've had a bunch of people say that, and I think that's a totally fair response, right? If, if you've got to decide how much you enjoy my content, if you don't enjoy it at all, or if like you're just right on that edge and the, and the thing that's going to push you over into unsubscription territory is me using the premieres, then that's, that's the right move, right? I'm, you should have already been unsubscribed. Um, and then the last option, of course, uh, and I'll provide this as a last response, of course, is you can uh, become a patron because then they get the videos in advance, no ads, and no premiere. Although I'm still recommending, I'm seeing a lot of the patrons show up for the premiere because it's such a good time. So uh, I'm sorry that that's a Canadian sorry that, uh, that I am using the premieres, but I really like it. And it's the, the benefits outweigh the costs. And so I will still continue to use it. But by all means, keep letting me know what you think. Um, keep clicking the down vote. And, uh, you know, hopefully we'll be able to pass that information back along to YouTube. And they'll be able to create a better, more granular functionality. So that maybe you as a viewer can say, hey, I don't ever want to see any premieres ever. I only want to watch videos after they've happened. And maybe we can get that message out to YouTube. So anyway. Thanks for uh, putting up with it so far. And for those of you who do like it, uh, I'll see you at the next premiere. Mike Kohler. Appreciate this update on the tech for returning to the moon. Thinking out of the box, I hate the fuel that constantly gets wasted to slow down at the end of any journey to a destination without significant atmosphere. Do you know of any R&D into a system like an aircraft carrier for landing a rest to slow the craft? So the problem with landing a spacecraft, say you want to land on the moon, right? Is that you're coming in at some high velocity, several kilometers per second, and you need to be able to slow down that spacecraft to zero and then have people disembark safely. And you need to have that, assuming it's humans. I mean, it could be cargo, then you can slow it down more rapidly. Um, but at the end of the day, you want to be able to do that in some way that doesn't use fuel. So there's a couple of ideas. One idea is that we could build a space elevator and put it on the moon. And so you would start on the surface of the moon, you'd have your space elevator come up to some space station that is at the Earth Moon L1 Lagrange point, And then you could just take cargo up and down this elevator. And the cool thing about it, right, is that as you're, you, know, you can counterweight it, right? So as you're bringing one, have you ever used a pulley that's got a counterweight on it, right? You can pull a really heavy amount of weight up and you're able to sort of counterbalance that weight at the same time. Um, so that's a great idea. And the cool thing about that is that you could use, say, a fabric like, like Spectra. Like there's fabrics that we have today, materials that could support the weight of a, of a lunar space elevator. Not so much on Earth, but definitely on the moon. So that's one idea. Another idea is that you could use a railgun. And so people have thought about this idea of using railguns on the moon to get cargo off of the moon. You've got supplies that you're mining on the moon and then you put them on your railgun and you fire them off into space and it takes energy. But you could run that in reverse. Think about how an electric car can refill its batteries as it's going down a hill. So you could have some spaceship or some cargo come on some approach vector for the, the moon, line up perfectly on the, on the railgun and then fly down the, the rail getting slowed down until it reaches the surface of the moon. And in fact, you would then gain energy back as you were slowing down this vehicle that was landing. Of course, the precision required to perfectly line up and land along this track uh, would be very important. And if you missed, then you would lithobrake.
uh, in the bad way. So uh, there's definitely a bunch of ideas. And this is the kind of thing that maybe over the next decades, hundreds of years, we will see some ideas on how we can go up and down gravity wells, saving energy, which is kind of a cool idea. Jay Pearson, Fraser, Patreon supporter here. With all the new telescopes coming online in the next decade, surely we'll be seeing deeper than ever. Will this change the calculated size and therefore age of the universe? So right now we can see the farthest that we can see is the cosmic microwave background radiation. And that is, that is the stuff that the light that was emitted just shortly, just a few hundred thousand years after the Big Bang. And if we were able to build a telescope that was a thousand times better than the best telescope that we have today, the farthest we could see is the cosmic microwave background radiation, right? That is essentially the beginning of the universe. And that is, you're seeing photons that have traveled almost 14 billion years to get to us. And those regions are now, you know, thanks to the expansion of space, are like 46 billion light years away from us in, in all directions. And we couldn't see any farther than that. We are already able to see as far as is possible in the universe. No amount of more powerful telescope will let us see any farther. Now, more powerful telescopes will let us see those objects, the first galaxies, the first stars, to be able to see them with more precision and more clarity, but we will never be able to see beyond them. And from what we know, the universe is only just a couple of hundred thousand years older than the cosmic microwave background. Now, if we are able to use, say, gravitational waves, they were emitted before the cosmic microwave background. And so we might be able to see a few hundred thousand years, almost right to the Big Bang itself. But that's it. And so no, we will never, no matter how good our telescopes get, we will never be able to see um, farther than we can today. And the universe will always remain roughly the age that it is that we know of it today. James Whitman, how big would a planet be before a rocket would be unable to get into orbit? They say that life would thrive on a super earth. So is it probable that we are the first advanced civilization on a planet small enough to get into space by such means? Here on earth, we are just barely able to get into space where when you imagine, you know, like with a rocket, the vast majority of a rocket is fuel. And as the rocket takes off, it's burning fuel like crazy. And it's going faster and faster and faster. It's turning more and more of its launch mass into velocity. And it's eventually able to go into orbit. And if the Earth had had a higher gravity, then you would need essentially the same size rocket, but you would be capable of launching a smaller payload. And so if the surface gravity of the Earth was say double, it would still be possible to launch rockets into space. It's just that you would need, say, a Saturn V to launch a Sputnik. And if the Earth was even more, you know, maybe we lived under three gravities, then you would need even, you know, a bigger rocket to launch a smaller payload. And eventually you would require, you know, if, if there was 10 times the force of gravity on Earth, you would need something like all of the matter in the universe turned into um, rocket fuel to be able to launch off of that, that world. So at a certain point, it gets ridiculous, right? But really, practically, if gravity was a little heavier than what we have today, it would be really, really challenging to get off Earth. And so you really would kind of imagine how frustrating it would be for creatures that might live on a super earth. Maybe they live in an aquatic environment, right? Uh, and they know that space exists and they've done a bunch of experiments and they really can't get very high. They can't get out of their gravity well. And so we're actually very fortunate that we have the gravity well as brutal as it is, as small as it is that we have. Jonathan Bennick. Hey Fraser, what will you do if you find out that some content of your old videos is out of date or proven false? Keep up the good work. The goal of science is to understand the universe. The goal of science is to seek truth in nature, to let nature tell us what is real and what isn't. And it's not our expectations and it's not our preconceived notions, right? And so if you believed one thing and then the evidence shows up that shows you that that thing that you believed isn't true, then you change your mind because now you have additional evidence, you know new things and you abandon the things that you used to believe and now you believe the new things because there is more evidence. And as long as you are allowing evidence 
to guide your intellectual journey, you will always be on roughly the right track. And there's things that are under contention, right? There's dark energy, which some astronomers say is this mysterious force that's expanding the universe. And it's a very unpalatable idea. And there's evidence maybe that that some of the underlying uh, math that's being done, some of the underlying observations aren't entirely correct. It could be that dark energy is going to go away. And we might make a video in a couple of years that, yep, dark energy has been convincingly, completely proven to not exist. I'll be happy to do it. I can't wait. Um, or that the new missions sent to study dark energy have have measured it with more precision than ever before. And so the the great thing about science is that it's perfectly happy, open minded, ready to change his mind as soon as new evidence shows up. Uh, same thing with UFOs, aliens, like as soon as the UFOs show up, and I have evidence that they exist. I'll change my mind. I'm on board. So uh, yeah, I can't wait to make some of these videos that showing how wrong I was in the past. Temp doom. Is it possible to predict when supernovae will occur visible from Earth? I know there were a couple that have happened during recorded history, the Crab Nebula, for example, and that one that happened a couple of years ago from our perspective in the cigar galaxy. Are there certain stars we watch for supernova potential? Great question. And I will hand this over to my astronomy cast co host, Dr. Pamela Gay, who took some time at the American Astronomical Society meeting to answer your question. Supernovae are one of these really frustrating things for observers, because we know that every galaxy like our own Milky Way should have a supernova every hundred years. But where's our supernova? We are owed one by statistics. And unfortunately, we don't know exactly which star is most likely to go. There are kinds of stars that you can predict are going to go boom. Type 1a supernovae, if you can see a system that's close enough to be able to resolve what's going on, we might be able to predict exactly when a white dwarf star is going to suck off too much matter and, well, explode. But unfortunately, there aren't any close enough that we've found yet that we can say that one's going to go. Instead, we look out for brighter objects that are easier to find, and in a few cases, they flare up and make themselves noticeable. Occasionally, we see what are called imposter supernova. Ada Carina did this back in the 1800s, where it suddenly became radically brighter before fading down to be what we see today. We think this kind of brightening that doesn't quite go boom and leaves the star behind is a precursor to what's yet to come. And we've seen this in a few other systems out there that we watch. But then there's stars like Betelgeuse that we know could go anytime today or in the next 100,000 years. I can't tell you when. I can just tell you we're all watching. Thanks, Pamela. That was fantastic. Of course, if you enjoyed that interaction, her voice, me talking to her about these things. Uh, that is, of course, the basis of our long running podcast, Astronomy Cast, which we have done more than 550 episodes now to date. So if you enjoy uh, hearing more about space and astronomy, specifically from this woman, um, you should definitely come and subscribe and follow us over on Astronomy Cast. I promise there's just bottomless amounts of space and astronomy information that you can get. And you might get a little idea of how I learned a lot of my material was mostly just asking her. So Subscribe to Astronomy Cast. I'll put a link in the show notes. I think I always do anyway. But thanks everyone for uh, asking your questions this week. That was a lot of fun. And uh, as always, wherever you are, across my channel, question pops in your brain, write it down, gather them up, and I'll answer them here. I'll see you next week.